So as well as haggis, neeps and tatties, did you know that the first ever Burns Night dinner included sheep's head? I was going to make a joke about keeping a straight face, but it seems in bad taste. So today is the 25th of January, better known as Burns Night. So Burns Night is an international day of feasting that began with a celebration of the life and works of the great Scottish poet Robert Burns. The first Burns Night supper took place in 1801. However, the first one actually took place on the 21st of July, exactly five years after the death of Robert Burns. And on this first ever Burns Night celebration, nine of his close friends came together to remember him, to eat, to drink, and to toast his memory. Whenever anyone thinks of food on Burns Night, they think of haggis, neeps, tatties, and whiskey. But that wasn't the whole story for the first one, because we know that the first ever Burns Night celebration in 1801 also included sheep's head on the menu. But before we get to the sheep's head, we need to stick with the classics. And that begins with haggis. So here we have a lovely haggis. A delicious concoction of sheep's heart, liver and lungs blended with onion, spices and I don't know, toenail clippings, I've lost track. So to cook this, I've got to wrap it very tightly in tin foil and essentially poach it for about an hour and a half. Although we all associate haggis with Scotland, it's not actually a given that Scots invented the dish. So the earliest documented mention of a sausage resembling haggis dates back to 423 BC, which was found in the works of the Greek playwright Aristophanes. There's one Scottish food historian who's claimed that haggis was actually invented in England after they found a cookbook that dated back to 1615 with a recipe for a similar sounding dish. There are also other schools of thought. There have also been some historians that have linked haggis to Scandinavia and the Vikings, because many established settlements in Scotland between the 8th and 13th centuries Century. And according to one etymologist, the word haggis stems from the old Norse word for cutting things up into pieces. So we've now wrapped this up into a lovely little tinfoil crab. I'm going to poach this for an hour and a half. So back to our sheep's head. That we wouldn't personally be my choice for a dinner party. It does make total sense. Burns' father was a farmer and throughout his life he kept horses, cows and sheep. He was referred to by some during his life as the Ploughman Poet, and his works and views often reflected that of his humble beginnings. So it makes a lot of sense that he would be an advocate of nose to tail eating, not just choosing the choice bits that the upper classes would. So to prep our head, I'm going to put it in a... Okay, I'm going to leave it like that. I'm going to cover it with some olive oil, just trying to encourage a bit of browning. So now our sheep's head is ready for the oven. Put it in the oven. Go. Make him face the other way, I think. So as well as haggis, most Burns Night dinners are famous for their neeps and tatties. Tatties are easy, they're just potatoes. However, I was not prepared for how much debate there is around what neeps are. So for most people, neeps are just this. It's a dish of mashed swede. But it's really confusing because some etymologists think that neeps is a corruption of the word turnip. The most British thing I read all week was a whole newspaper article written by a Scottish food editor who wrote an extensive article to try and find out whether neeps are turnips or swede. And the final conclusion of their piece was, well, no one really knows. So to avoid offending any rampant vegetable fans out there, I'm just gonna do both. So like many people, I mainly know Burns through probably a very small cross section of his poetic works. But there are lots of other very interesting facts about Burns that I was happy to learn through this week. Throughout his life, he fathered 12 children through four different women. By some accounts, he also kept a locked drawer full of erotic and, depending on who you ask, pornographic poetic works. Titles included The Fornicator and Nine Inches Will Please a Lady. So let's just say he had appetites that went beyond haggis. One of the things that comes up very often is that he almost left Scotland to go to Jamaica. He had struggled to make a living as a farmer. I need a bigger knife. So he took up a job at a sugar plantation in Jamaica. So he published a book of his poems chiefly in the Scottish dialect in the same year in order to raise money for his journey. But it actually became such a surprise hit that he didn't need to solve his money troubles by leaving. So instead he moved to Edinburgh and published a second edition of his poetry book. There we go. Moving on to the turnips. Later on in life, he took up a job as a tax collector. His working life also came under scrutiny for support of the American and French Revolution. So here's what happened. Both the American and the French Revolution had made the British a bit jumpy, to put it mildly. And they were particularly wary of sympathizers on the home front. And while he was working as a tax collector, his pro-revolutionary sympathies uh, got picked up by his employers. And so he joined the Royal Dumfries Volunteers, which was a voluntary organization designed to defend the country against any threats from post-revolutionary France. Thus go the turnips. And then to cap us off, we have potatoes. Okay, my haggis is on, my sheep's head is in the oven, which I'm still finding strange to say. My potatoes, Sweden turnips are on the hob. So an hour later and we have roast sheep's head 
So my immediate observation, having never roasted a uh, sheep's head before, the, uh, if I tell you that the eyes have melted out, you just trust me on this one, okay? To be fair, it just smells like roast lamb, which is not a bad thing. It's just not particularly appetizing to look at. So we've got our sheep's head, and now it's time to do the haggis. So we've got our neeps and tatties, and here is our haggis. If you ask most people what drink they associate with Burns Night, they'll say whiskey. Thankfully, I've got a little uh, scotch left over from my Walt Disney episode. Some historians say that the uh, original toast would most likely have been made with ale or wine. So, covering both bases here. Scoop out some of our lovely haggis. Just smells like a black pudding right now. It smells delicious. I'm really not sure whether or not the uh, head or the haggis represents safety for me in this instance. I'm gonna start with this bad boy. He's my friend. Let's try some. I've forgotten how tasty haggis is. I know that's probably sacrilege to most Scots people watching, if there are any watching. But yeah, the spicing just feels like black pudding to me. I only run into danger if I think too much about what I'm eating. But very tasty. Now at this point, I'm gonna try and see if I can dig in. That is some um, very nice tender cheek meat. Again, it's lamb cheek. It's very tasty. It's really calling out for maybe a little bit better presentation and some mint sauce. I also do appreciate probably if they were serving sheep's heads, I imagine they're gonna be cracking into that. Do I wanna, no. I just tried to pull the tongue. I confirm it's not coming out, so I'm taking that as a mark of respect and leaving it in there. This all being said, if you're already tucking into sheep's heart, liver and lungs for Burns Night, having a sheep's head really doesn't feel that extreme by comparison. Thanks so much for watching. Please consider subscribing, give me a thumbs up, or drop me a comment if there's something else you'd like to see me recreate from history. <laughs> So did you know? Uh, how do I get into this?